Ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, thank you all so very much for joining me for another episode of Overanalyzed Adventures. I'm continuing the overanalysis of The Slaughter, Act 1, and this is where we left off. We're in a tub and we just had a trip of dream where we killed a prostitute. <laughs> Yes, indeed, our protagonist is meeting up with the sister of the dead prostitute who saved us from being, well, beaten to death by a child and his thug. So our hero does what he was paid to do. He returns the locket to the lady with, well, no repercussions, other than he's a lot richer now. But don't forget, our hero has a thing for the dead prostitute sister of this lady. Yeah. That's going to be the driving narrative for the rest of the game because for whatever reason, their brief encounter left a very deep and substantial impact on our hero. And now he's going to do something that, well, a cynical nor detective shouldn't normally do, but since he's been hit right in the fields, he's going to do it anyway. <laughs> Just in case you can't see it coming, our hero is going to investigate the murder of the prostitute. Sure, he's going to be paid to do it, at least upon completion of finding the murderer, but still we need to forget that our hero really had a thing for this prostitute that he briefly met. So, you could almost say, this time, it's personal. So personal that he's been invited to her funeral by her sister. I guess our hero just gets along with all the ladies in this family. And in fact, it's just about the only thing that our protagonist gets along with. Well, other than this pub that we're going to because we have nowhere else to go to. So our hero is beginning the investigation of the murder of Alice, the prostitute who saved our life, and the sister of the rich lady that's paying us to figure out who murdered her. And it's kind of curious we're here at the pub because, well, this is not where we met her. You'd think we'd start off in the alley or somewhere like that. But no, the pub's where we gotta begin our investigation. Personally, I'd be investigating the mysterious case of how my glasses always get empty. But no, our hero's gonna find some clues about the murderer somewhere around here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, to be perfectly, completely, and utterly, and brutally honest with you, I did not have an easy go of this section of the game. That's not to say that this game is difficult. It's just to say, at least for me, this area did not feel very intense. Intuitive. So in other words, I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. But then I bothered to take a look at that cigarette case that I collected in the morgue. And lo and behold, there was a note inside of it that would change this game forever. Yeah, that note said CK Members Club 11pm. There's no date on it, so we're assuming it must have happened right before her murder. Otherwise, why would you keep such an inane note in your cigarette case, right? But nevertheless, fortune always seems to find our protagonist, because believe it or not, he is standing right in front of the entranceway to the CK Members Club. The only problem is, the bouncer won't let him in. So now our hero's gotta figure out a way to get past the bouncer. And once again, it's gonna take some Monkey Island-esque absurdity in order to solve this puzzle. Because that's what it is, getting past the bouncer is a puzzle. A puzzle involving us winning a game of push pennies against a homeless man. Or is it called push a penny? I don't know what it is. Penny push? Penny- why well, it's this game. That's right, this is one of those adventure games with a mini-game inside of it. A mini-game that clearly the developer is very proud of, and good on him, cause it's fun, but, well, it's also mandatory. And I just so happen to be pretty terrible at this game. Now you may be wondering to yourself, Guy, why are you playing it to begin with? Well you see, we wanna win the wooden hand off of this homeless guy. Why, you ask? Well, it's the only thing that we could win. So, yeah, that's the short and the long of it. I mean, we're going to need it to get past the bouncer, but... Yeah, it doesn't seem really intuitive while you're doing it now, does it? Anyway, I was so bad at the game that the homeless man eventually took pity upon me and just gave me his hand. Wonderful. And what's also wonderful is that eventually I figured out that the bouncer would let us go downstairs if we beat him at an arm wrestling competition. And as you could imagine, our hero is so pathetically weak that he's going to outright lose every time he tries to win legitimately. So naturally, we're going to have to figure out a way to cheat. And lo and behold, things are starting to come together now. We attach the wooden hand to a pole, and then we clamp it down to the desk, and then, well, the bouncer's an idiot. Once again, we're investigating the murder of a prostitute killed in the middle of the night rather viciously by Jack the Ripper. Again, I wasn't lying about the game kind of having an odd tone. 
So now our hero's down in the members club and we needn't worry about the bouncer ever again because he's a moron. But oh hey, look here. One of our hero's oldest and dearest friends also just so happens to be down here. Now Cedric exists here to primarily give us a little bit of information about who next to talk to in our investigation. But I don't know if that's really all that necessary considering there's only a couple of people down here that we can talk to. But nevertheless I suppose he's also here to flesh out our character a little bit more and to give him something of a backstory. Because as of right now there's not a whole lot we know about Sydney, other than he's obsessed with the dead lady and that he's a private investigator down on his luck. Yes, once again, our hero's gonna drink like a fish. But first, let's go talk to some people about the murder of Alice. After all, that's what we're here for, right? Yeah, that's pretty badass and private eye of Sydney. Now you may be wondering why it was necessary for such theatrics. Well, you see this top hat wearing gentleman right here was the last guy seen with Alice when she was alive. So he's our primary suspect, so we're going to have to be tough on him. While I can't appreciate the nor qualities that our hero being obsessed with a dead prostitute brings to this story, still I find it a bit odd that this man's so protective of a woman who he never really even knew. To be perfectly honest with you, he spent a total of what? An hour with her? Couple? Half a day maybe? But also bear in mind he was in incredible pain, so it just strikes me as a bit odd, that's all. I don't know, maybe our hero's just very obsessive when it comes to women. Not a very endearing quality. But nevertheless, like all good mysteries, our first lead's a dead end. So our hero talks to some more people and eventually figures out that Alice went home with that little mafioso that we met at the very beginning of the game. You know that little kid with the top hat and the thug that was, well, trying to kill Sydney? Yeah, that little guy. He's the one who went home with Alice. And yeah, that's kind of really messed up when you think about it. Alice is a grown ass woman and this little boy here is a little boy. Like, I think he's 13 years old. Yeah, game, kind of weird. Seems like some anime stuff's going on here. And clearly the strangeness is affecting our hero because guess what he's gonna do now? Yeah, he's gonna drink like a fish. Probably because he can't really handle the thought of his best gal going home with a little boy and doing, well, prostitute things. So now that our hero's drunk, he tastefully sings a song about, well, death and murder. Hey, he's drunk. So now that we got that out of the way, let's go to a funeral. And of course it's raining, after all, the mood needs to be depressed and melancholy. And yeah, we're basically the only guy here, other than the sister and her husband, who like a lot of characters in adventure games, won't be able to hear what we're saying even though he's standing awfully close to us. And yeah, it just stops raining, probably for atmospheric reasons. Not to judge, it's just kind of funny. English weather, I suppose. So the sister goes on to say the reason why no one's at the funeral is because it would be a social faux pas for such middle class people to be seen at a funeral of a whore, even though they're the only people at a funeral for a whore. Anyway, we get a little bit more backstory about the sister. She married this man, he's a nice man, don't feel bad about it, and oh yeah, don't tell him that you're looking into the murder of my sister, even though he should be able to hear us considering he's standing, what, a few feet away? But to be perfectly honest with you, when I was first playing through this game, I thought that dude over there was like her chauffeur or servant or something but now nah, that's her husband he just had bad hearing i suppose
Well, that was really, really delightful. So let's go ahead and go back to the investigation. That's right, we're going to that little boy's house, Charlie Finch, to confront him about what he knows about Alice. And as you would expect, the thug's not gonna let us in. Although he seems like a pretty nice guy. And once again, we are faced with another gatekeeper puzzle. The third time in this game, in fact. So, how are we gonna get out of this one, you ask? How are we gonna get into Charlie Finch's house? Well, we're gonna have to partake of the great English tradition of cross-dressing. So, we go down to the brothel and chit-chat with the locals there, who are more than happy to teach our hero how to cross-dress properly. In fact, one of them's currently doing it right now. Delightful. And he's more than happy to give us his wig. He has a spare, and I'm sure that is someone's fetish. But now that all that really remains in order to complete this game is to assemble the necessary parts to pass as a woman. Could you see, Charlie Finch is not letting a man into his house, but he's gladly letting in all the ladies. So let's do our best to look like one. So first things first, let's go talk to our landlord. Because it turns out, there's a locked wardrobe in our house that we've never bothered to unlock. And lo and behold, turns out whoever used to rent our house, well, he liked to engage in cross-dressing because there's a dress inside of the wardrobe. I mean, talk about a coincidence. Wow, without that, we'd really be screwed. But hey, we got the wig from one of the prostitutes that just gracefully gave it to us upon asking, and now we need to talk to our friend Cedric, who apparently is into makeup and owns a makeup company. So now we're all gonna be dolled up and look like a beautiful lady of the night. Well, you heard the man, let's make our way to Charlie Finch's house. But first, we have to get in a little bit of a bar fight. Because those two guys in the background said something racist to our friend. Yeah, it's kind of weird that our cross-dressing hero gets kicked out of the bar, but our friend, whose honor we're defending, is already outside, probably smoking a cigarette and just waiting for us to, rather dramatically, be kicked out of the bar. But at last, we can now make our way to Charlie Finch's house, the little mafioso. Really, all we need to do is just walk past the thug, and boom, we inside. So you may be wondering, what's our hero's plan here? It's pretty much wing it. Yeah, you would think, well, prostitute comes into a man's room, they're gonna do... They're gonna have sex. I mean, our protagonist was prepared to have sex with a little boy. Kind of messed up. But fortunately for our hero, and for this game not to get an AO rating, all the little boy wants out of us is to read some stories to him. Which we do. And then after a while, he opens up about why he's so freaked out. And then he tells us all about that night with Alice. So yeah, he was with Alice and then the Ripper came over and killed Alice. He saw it with his own two eyes. In fact, he saw exactly what Jack the Ripper looks like. In vivid detail, like his little boy knows this man's face. So our hero tries to get the little boy to tell us exactly what the Ripper looks like, but it's not gonna happen. Because just before he's about to tell us every detail, he suddenly gets over the entire situation and is like, you know what, I feel good, the weight of the world's off my chest. Let's go have sex. And I'm not kidding you, he literally is like, oh, I don't feel bad about the murder I witnessed anymore. I want to do it with you. So all our hero can really do here is try to freshen up and delay to the inevitable because this boy's in for a surprise. <laughs> Yeah, hero, how exactly are you going to get out of this situation where you're about to have sex with a little boy? <laughs> yeah. 
It's our hero who comes up with a grand plan of doing nothing and hoping for the best. Oh, that's wonderful. Everything's worked out for our hero. The little boy is brutally murdered. Well, that got us out of one awkward situation, I'll tell you. And yeah, once again, the game's tone really changes here. This is pretty damn gruesome. And oh yeah, the killer's left a note in his neck. Yeah, the spot where all the blood's squirting out of. Yeah, our hero's taking evidence from a crime scene. Surely this won't come back to haunt him. One way or another, this will be my last case. Ooh, so ominous. And yeah, that does it for the Slaughter Act 1. A really peculiar game. A game I liked, but a game that also felt kind of like an art house movie. Like, I kind of understood what was happening, but I didn't quite get why. It's a bit of a weird game. Still good, but very odd, very unusual, very peculiar, very homemade feeling. And that's not to be like a put down or anything. That's to say you can really tell that there's a particular vision that this author has and he sure as hell is making it. Fascinating game. I really want to see where this whole thing goes because right now I'm pretty intrigued just for the sake of how odd and different this game truly is. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen and everybody in between, I'll see you next time, hopefully.